make you uncomfortable, keep you on your toes type of deal. So we're going to jump into the book of Ecclesiastes, if you would, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So if you would find your way there, you can use the Pew Bible that we provide for you. That would be on page 519, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want to start by reading verses 1 through 15, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And look at verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Verse 5. A time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, and a time to lose. A time to keep, and a time to cast away. Verse 7, a time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. Verse 9, what gain has the worker from his toil. I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure and all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceived, verse 14, that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word this morning as we come together. We thank you for the celebration of the Lord's death and the Lord's supper. We anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to this passage, I pray, as always, that you would use the spirit in our lives to understand what's being said and how it applies to our lives. We pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Carl Truman wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. In it, he, he makes this observation. If you have not read the book, good luck. <laughs> it's not an easy book, but it's very good. But he makes the point that expressive individualism is something that affects us all. It is the very essence of the culture of which we are all a part. To put it bluntly... We are all expressive individuals now. Just as some choose to identify themselves by their sexual orientation, so the religious person chooses to be a Christian or Muslim. That's a great book. It it helps us understand how our culture has so readily accepted the current situation we're finding ourselves in. But I quote him um, because of his blunt statement. We all are expressive individuals, and that, no doubt, is the heart of our culture, expressive individualism. You can be whoever you want to be, choose the life you want to live, and should be free from any judgmental looks or glances or inhibitions, of course, unless you know, society thinks you should not be that. But for the most part, that is how our culture operates. That's how most people in the world are. And this idea of expressive individualism really helps us to understand today. It's really led to the mess that we have within our culture. And what I appreciate about Carl Truman is he makes the point that we all are in this. We all are expressive individuals. He actually doesn't really talk much about that, cult, that, that concept in his book, 
but he makes that point that is so obvious and so important. We all are a part of that. It's the world we live in, each one of us, whether you're a professing Christian or not. And at the heart of of, of expressive individualism is the, this is going to be shocking, individual, the self, me, I, I choose who I am. I choose how I want to express myself and what I want others to think of me or to affirm about me. And listen, I'm not here to bash our culture. To be honest with you, culture bashing rarely makes me love Jesus more or helps me have a compassion for the lost, okay? But this is the culture we live in. And I bring it up because we're a part of it and it impacts us and our spiritual walk. Expressive individualism is basically how we all live now. And, and, and that idea of expressive individualism, if you think about it, at its root is pride. At its root is selfishness. It fosters pride in our hearts and creates this illusion, and this is important, that we are actually in control of things. That we can control our little universe that we live in, which is something we all want. We all want control, don't we? We all want to be like God, and we all want to take control of our destiny, as it were, and and in a sense, that's kind of at the heart of the fall in the scriptures. This is what the serpent appealed to in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the thought of being like God appealed to Adam and Eve to have independence from his oversight Uh, to not have to follow his word. And then you keep reading through the Bible and you get to the days of Noah. And what was the world like during the days of Noah? Man did whatever he wanted in his own eyes. He was the complete essence of the expressive individual. He wanted this and he therefore went and got it. You get to Genesis chapter 11. You have the Tower of Babel and this great rebellion against God where they are desiring to make themselves great. So by the time you get through the first book of the Bible, which you still got a long ways to go, it's clear that at the heart of fallen humanity is this desire to be our own rulers, to be our own self, like God, as it were, in complete control. And today, Expressive individualism is just another expression of humanity's grasp for control and pride. If we're honest, we are men and women who want to be gods of our universe. But we aren't God. We do the best that we can to exercise control in our lives, and whether that be in our relationship with one another or our experiences or our destinies, but we aren't God. And as much as we don't want to admit it, we aren't in control. And it's this fact that Solomon now moves to in our text in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon started off the book by exploring the world under the sun without an acknowledgement of the God above the sun. And so he, he went to find fulfillment. He went to find meaning. And he did that by seeking out wisdom and pleasure, if you remember. But neither of these things lived up to their promises. They came short. Neither brought fulfillment. And then as he's thinking about this in chapter 2, we get to verse 12 and following. He realizes that no matter what, whether it be wisdom or pleasure, they're temporary. Because... We're temporary. We will all die one day. Whether or not we live wisely or foolishly or with pleasure or penniless, it doesn't matter. We will die. So his conclusion of this life under the sun as he looks at it without God in the picture is vanity. Thirteen times the word vanity shows up 
in the first two chapters to chapter uh, 2, verse 23. Thirteen times. But last week, we noticed, look at verse 24 of chapter 2, the tone changes a bit. Now Solomon is not just reasoning from under the sun, but he's recognizing the Lord above the sun. So you see that in verse 24. There's nothing better for a person than she'd eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, that's God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. So he stops and he, and he, he acknowledges God and he teaches us in those verses how to properly look at pleasures in this life and the, and the spheres of which the things he explored in chapter the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. He, he, he encourages us to, in, to enjoy it. It's not a blanket statement of hedonism but rather a reminder that you can only enjoy it, you can only have true joy if you recognize that enjoyment itself is a gift from God. That's what he says in verses 24 and 25. And that our pursuit, this is verse 26, should be less on enjoyment and more on the goal of pleasing the Lord. Enjoyment's a byproduct, as it were. Now we come to chapter 3. Solomon still has God in the picture. This is important to help us understand those verses. God's still in the picture now. And he turns to the idea of time, history, place. And look at verses 1 through 8. Starts with a very familiar passage of Scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. If you're going to be part of the legacy ministry, you probably are familiar with a song, or you listen to 94.5, which is the oldie station, you'll find that every so often you might get a song that comes on, Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds, which is virtually this this exact passage, verses 2 through 8. Just a little music fact in case you're wondering. That was not written by the birds. It was written six years earlier by a man, I only know this because of Wikipedia, uh, by a man named Pete Seeger, who was striving for world peace, but the birds took this and they wanted to say no to the Vietnam War, and they came out with the song and made it popular, Turn, Turn, Turn. And if you ever hear that song, all the song except for three lines are actually this passage of Scripture, verses 2 through 8, to everything there is a season. Now, the point of this poem, and it's actually pretty simple, look at verse 1. For everything, he says, there is a season. In a time for every matter under heaven. Now he's under heaven. He's focused not just under, under the sun, but he's still now keeping in fact in mind that under heaven, there's one above heaven, you could say, who's controlling what's happening under heaven. And under heaven means everything here, everything you see has its time and its place because of the one who is above heaven. Is over time and history. And all these things that he mentions, verses 2 through 8, you can look through them all. I mean, they're all part of the human experience at some time or another. That's basically what he's pointing out. He uses opposites. He uses extremes to, the, to completeness, to express fullness. It's actually a literary device that people use called merism, where you talk about these two things so that you get everything in between. And he's saying, look, you have here a time to be born on the one hand and a time to die and everything in between. You have uh, a time to plant and a time to pluck up up what is planted. That's hard for me today. And everything in between. Time to kill, a time to heal. And and he's just making these observations. And most of this makes sense. Time to weep, time to laugh. Look at verse 5, though. This one gets a little interesting. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. And people debate, what, you know, what's he talking about there? There's actually five views, and it's a waste of energy and time, in my opinion, to discuss them. But probably he's talking about gathering stones to get a field ready to be plowed or throwing stones on a field so that you can't get it ready for soil. That's probably what he's talking about. I don't know. It doesn't matter because you get the, pic- the picture. You get the point, right? All of these things happen. All of these things take place. All of it has a place and a purpose, of which we may not understand. And here's the important point, over which we exercise no control. 
We don't have control over these things. God does. That's why, look at verse 11. He, God, has made everything. What do you think he's talking about? Everything we just talked about, right? Look at verse 1. For everything there is a season, and then he goes through all these things. And now he goes to verse 11. He, God, has made everything beautiful in his time. God is the one who makes these things take place. God is the one sovereign over all these things, you might say. He is the one who brings them. Remember what David said in Psalm 139, verse 16? Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. What is them? The days that were formed for me. Before I was even born, all my days were in your hand. You were over all of them. When as yet there was none of them. God knows our days, each of them. They're written in his book. God doesn't wake up in the morning and go, well, I'm surprised by what happened today. Now, he's the one who created the seasons for planting and for harvesting. He's the one who's over the the epics of this world, the ages and the kingdoms of the earth. After Nebuchadnezzar had been humbled by the Lord in the book of Daniel, he came to grips with this. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 through 35. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Now he's going to speak truthfully. At the beginning of this whole sequence, he says, look at this great place I've made, Babylon. And God says, okay, you're going to be like an animal now to learn the lesson. And now he's learned his lesson. What's he say? His dominion is everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say, what have you done? God is sovereign over these things, not us. We experience them, and we're players, you could say, as it plays out, but we do not control them. And living in a culture that thrives on expressive individualism, that's a difficult pill to swallow. As much as we like to think we're in control and do everything within our power to be in control of our world, every person in this room, in this universe, at some point or another will be faced with this reality. They are not in control. But God is. God is sovereign. He's over time and space. History is his story, as it were, unfolding. And though we might grasp and try to have as much control over little control that we actually have, the reality is bound to face us at some point or another. But how do you respond to this? And that answer lies in what he says in verses 9 through 15. Verses 1 through 8 was his poem. He's observing the world, describing what he sees from his limited point of view. And now he responds to this. All these things, verses 1 through 8, take place. Everything in between. They each have their time. They're each in their place in God's ordering of things. And they're beyond our control. He is God. We are not. He is sovereign. We are not. So how do we respond to this reality? That's verses 9 through 15. Three ways. First, come to grips with the fact that you are not sovereign. Come to grips with the fact that you are not sovereign. Look at verse 9. What gain has the worker from his toil? We've seen that question. We already saw that in chapter 1. Look back. Chapter 1, verse 3. Same type of question. There, when he says, what does a man gain by all the toil which he toils under the sun? In chapter 1, God's not in the picture here. It was a question driven by despair. But here, he's just looked at everything that you see in chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. God is in the picture. And so he naturally asks, well, what gain has the worker from his toil? And in verse 10, he keeps going. He doesn't conclude its vanity like he has been. Rather, in verse 10, he makes another observation. Verse 10, I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He confirms that he's deeply thought about life. I've seen it all. I've seen what they're doing. I've observed it all. I know how life leads. 
And he's already done this, right? Look back at chapter 1, verse 13. Without God in the picture, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom, verse 13. All that is done under heaven, it's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything that's done under the sun, verse 14. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. He didn't have the God in the picture, but now he does. So look at chapter 3, verse 11. Well, go back to verse 9. What gain is he from all his toil? Verse 10, I've seen everything that God's done, the children of man to be busy with. And now it's not a vanity. Look at verse 11. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Now God is in the, the picture. He doesn't conclude the same way. Now, that word beautiful, the NASB, the New American Standard, says appropriate. That's the idea. It's fitting. Everything is fitting, he's saying. He has made everything fitting in his time. In God's world, all of life unfolds in an appropriate manner, in a fitting way according to the sovereign hand of God. It may seem like random. It may seem like chaos, but it's in God's hand, and it is fitting. And he says, look what he does at the end of verse 11 there. Also, he, God, has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God has placed within all of us eternity. The reality of eternity. The reality that there is something bigger than us. As I look at, think about what Solomon's doing. He's looking at all these things and he says, and God placed within me, as I look at all these things, that there's got to be something bigger to all this. There's got to be something greater to all this. There has to be something after our death. I mean, God has placed within us this idea that we're not made solely for this earthly existence and there has to be a sense to everything you saw in verses 2 through 8. And in all of God's creation, if you think about it, we're the creatures that have that type of thinking, don't we? I mean, my dog's at home right now. My dog's not thinking about its existence in eternity. Because when I come home, nothing else matters at that point. You're home, this is the greatest time of my life. And the tail goes nuts. And it's a Scotty, so there's a bit of an attitude there, too. But no cat, no whale or, or chimpanzee thinks about eternity like this and trying to put all the pieces together because God has placed it in the heart of humanity and not them. I was debating whether to, to share this. I, I don't have it on there, but Francis Schaeffer wrote this book, The God who is there. And he's talking about the fact that in our time and culture, you are here by accident. If God's out of the picture, you're all an accident. Isn't that encouraging? You all just happen to evolve. Humans and humanity evolved from non-human things. And he says, let's play that out for a little bit. Because Francis Schaeffer knows the reality of verse 11, that God has put eternity into man's heart. We do strive for something greater. So he says this. If man has been kicked up by chance out of what is only impersonal, in other words, if we, became, if we came to existence from some impersonal glob that eventually led to where we are today, that's what he's saying. If we, by chance, were kicked up of what is only impersonal, then those things that make him man, hope of purpose, significance, love, motions of morality and rationality, beauty and verbal communication, are ultimately unfulfillable and thus meaningless. In such a situation, is man higher or lower? If man, no, this is a track with me. <laughs> it's a lot for a sunny, warm day. If we have a sense of purpose that we need to have in our life, 
but we got it from impersonal things and we can't find fulfillment in it. Well, this is kind of, are we really a more evolved creature? That's what he's saying. Have we evolved to the point we don't get fulfillment in our life? Does that make us more evolved? That's what he's saying. No. He would then be the lowest creature on the scale because the green moss on the rock is higher than he because it can find its fulfillment in the universe in which it exists. But if the world is what these men say it is, then men, not only individually but as a race, being unfulfilled is dead. In this situation, man should not walk on the grass but respect it because it's higher than he. Now, I can provide that for you if you want to meditate on that and try to figure out what he's saying. But all he's doing is acknowledging the reality of what you see here in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, that every single one of us has eternity in our heart. We know that there's something greater. And we know that what you see in verses 2 through 8 is not random, but has some type of purpose. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 20, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they were without excuse. God has made himself known to us in this created world. And here Solomon's basically saying the same thing, that he's placed within every single one of us a concept of eternity, a concept that there's got to be something greater and something bigger. But then he says at the end of the verse, what? On our own, we cannot figure this out. We can't put all the pieces together of how each of these parts make sense in the whole. That's what he's saying in verse 11, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Why? Here it is. You are God, and I am not God. We're not writing history. Solomon says, I think, what he does in verse 11 because he had to come to grips with this reality in his life. All these things take place, and I have no control over them. I am not sovereign. And we need to come to grips with this reality. You and I need to come to grips with the fact that we're not sovereign. This is easy to forget, is it not? In the culture in which we live in, a culture of expressive individualism, we live in an illusion that we have control over our own lives, but we don't. And once again, I must turn to the great theologian Bill Watterson to help us understand and illustrate exactly what Solomon's doing. By the end of Ecclesiastes, you will all be adamant readers of Calvin and Hobbes, and you will recognize, I actually got another Calvin and Hobbes strip sent to me today, uh, this week. And the guy was like, uh, it was Jeff, he's like, he was reading Ecclesiastes, wasn't he? I'm like, yes, that's why I like Bill Watterson, because this is us in the world we live in. We think we wield power and control over the things around us, and then God reminds us, no, I am in control. You are not. If you have a hard time reading it, I'll send it to you. Basically, he's saying, I'm withholding water from you because I wield the power over you. And then it rains. But that's us. We're all Calvin. Thinking we wield power, but the fact of the matter is, though we have eternity in our heart, we can truly not make sense of this world because we are not God. We are not in control. We are not sovereign. And we have to come to grips with this reality. Or else you will live in constant frustration constant disappointment, ungratefulness, and pride. That's the first reaction. Let's look at the second one. we got to move here because we still want to sing. Verses 12 and 13. Secondly, first, come to grips with the reality you're not sovereign. Secondly, enjoy our blessings as a gift from God and pursue good. Look at verse 12. Notice how it starts. I perceived. You see this again in verse 14. See it again? I perceived. It's almost like as he thinks about this, he's not seeing anymore. He's got a little bit more insight. I'm perceiving. I'm making conclusions about the reality that 
I'm trying to make sense of all this, but I'm not sovereign, so I cannot. Therefore, verse 12, I perceive that there's nothing better for them to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Enjoy our blessings as a gift from God and pursue good. God is sovereign and we are not, and so Solomon perceived what he does in verses 12 through 13. Pretty much what we just saw, if you flip back to chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. But, but now it's not driven by his desire for fulfillment, but rather his advice comes on the, the heels of what he just said in verses 2 through 8. There's a time to be born, a time to die. There's this, there's that. All these things happen to us and in this world in which God is sovereign. So therefore, when you enjoy life, when you are experiencing pleasure, when there's food on the table and shelter over your head, all these are from the sovereign hand of God, and the enjoyment that we get is a gift to us. So enjoy it and recognize it is from his hand. Take pleasure in it. It's from the Lord. Don't you love that food tastes good? depending on who's cooking. But imagine if some of you treat food like you're a garbage disposal and you're just shoving it in. But imagine if one of the most important things we did in our life didn't taste good. There was no pleasure in it. And that's a gift from God. Notice as well in verse number 12. Not only called to enjoy it, but verse 12, be joyful and to do good. This long as they live, pursue good. He'll remind the young people in, in, in chapter 12, one of my favorite verses for a youth group, that remember the creator while you're young. Keep God in the picture now while you're young before it gets later and you don't enjoy food anymore. Keep him now before you at the forefront of your life. Do good, he's saying, as long as you live. Make the most of your days. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. In light of the fact that you're not in control, what should you do? Do good. Make the best use of the time, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. Because the fact is, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. We just don't know how many days we have. We don't know when we'll experience the different things you see in chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. So don't waste the days that you're given. Pursue good. Live for the Lord. Do good in every sphere of life, whether it's at home or in school or in your community or your work. Enjoy the good that God has gifted you and do good. So in light of the reality of God's sovereign hand, number one, Come to grips with the fact you're not sovereign. That could go a long way. Number two, enjoy the things from God and pursue good. And now thirdly, verses 14 through 15, fear the Lord. Notice verse 14. I perceived, once again, I, I perceived, I concluded, I, I saw beyond just simply seeing, now I'm perceiving that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. It's another way of saying God's in control. God has done it. Why? Here it is. So that people fear before him. No matter what, God's purposes and plans stand. That's the beginning of verse 14. It always does. Whatever God has will, whatever he's decreed, it will take place. It will happen. That's what makes God God. It's all over Scripture. Psalm 33, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plan of his heart to all generations. Isaiah 49, verses, excuse me, 46, 9 through 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things yet not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. He is sovereign. He's in control. Proverbs 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You know that's true from your own life. How many times have you planned something out and all of a sudden it gets changed out of your hands? Why? Because the purpose of the Lord is what will stand. 
And so in verse 14, when he says, I perceive whatever God does endures forever, nothing can be added to it or taken from it, God has done it. All he's saying is repeating the simple fact of what we've been saying all along. God's in control. He's sovereign. Why, though? End of verse 14. So that people fear before him. The fact that God is sovereign and you're not should cause you to fear the Lord. The sovereign hand of the Lord should instill a healthy fear within us. The fact that we're not in control and God is in control should instill a fear of God within us. The the fact that God's sovereign and we're not will do one of two things to you. It will drive you in frustration that you're not in control or it will drive you to fear that he is in awe of who he is and reverence that even my days are in the hands of the Lord, me, insignificant me, who's a blip on the line of world history. But God knows me and is over my life. How could we not fear before him? When we think we're in control, think about it. You think very little of God when you think you're in control. But when we realize we're no way in control of our little universe, you cannot help but fear God and be in awe of the God of the universe. And that's what he actually is to keep developing in verse 15. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. It enhances our fear of God, if you understand what he's getting there. It's not like a, a statement, well, perpetual recycling of events. But the idea is God brings these things to happen again and again and again to remind us that he's the one in control. So that we think of the greatest day in infamy, some of us will think back to June 6, 1944, but some of us will think of September 11th. 2001. Because God's reminding us over and over and over again, no, 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 no. You need to be reminded, because he's a gracious and loving God, that I'm in control, not you. If that wasn't enough, look at the end of verse 15. This is kind of a confusing line. And God seeks what has been driven away. It's a surely uh, difficult Statement, translate a couple of different ways. If you look at the ESV, it has a footnote there trying to make sense of it. What in the world is he saying? Does it mean that God has pursued or seeks that which is driven away or has been pursued? What, is, what does that mean? The idea is that God seeks out what is driven away. It means that God is able to seek out that which has already been passed. That's really the idea of that phrase. And what it is is a statement of God's sovereign hand over time because God can recall all that has taken place and show you again. Now, that's significant because he's transitioning. Look at verse 16 and 17. He's transitioning to something to remind us of why this is important. God is over time, so he can, he can go back and pull something back. Why does that matter? Because all these injustices in the world, God can say, no, 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 no. I can bring that to judgment. Let me take you back to that. Because I'm over history. That's what he's getting at in verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun, place of justice, even there was wickedness. The place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. That's government. It doesn't matter who's in politics, you know, Republican or Democrat. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. Why can he do that? For there is a time for every matter, every work. Why can he do that? Because God is the one who seeks what's already been passed. He's the one who seeks what's already been driven away. He can go back and say, yes, I've seen this. I can take you under judgment. He's, oh, it's just a great statement of God's sovereign hand over the world. You need an incentive to fear the Lord. How about the fact that God can look back in each of our pasts? It's an incentive to fear the Lord. And yet you're here. And you haven't got what you deserved. How can we not fear him? How can we not serve him? 
One day we'll stand before the Lord, and because he's sovereign over history, he's the one who can bring out the past and show us all these actions. But isn't it great that those who know the Lord Jesus Christ will say, but I see my son. And those of you that aren't in Christ, let me just say, when he seeks the past, he seeks it with great detail. He knows every single thing of our heart, every single thing we've done. That's how powerful and great he is. And yet, believers, if you're here, we just took part of a ritual that reminds us we're forgiven and free. So his sovereignty should drive us to fear him. Cause us to fear him. God is sovereign, we are not. You got to come to grips with this. We're not in control. So listen, when the good times come, enjoy them from the sovereign hand of God. Pursue good. And the fact that he's sovereign should cause all of us to be in awe of him, to fear him, and to serve him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. So much here, so much to unpack. It's just scratching the surface, Lord, but drive this home, I ask. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.